Now pray with me. Before I do that, I want to remind you of one of the verses some are reading. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The award-winning journalist Nicholas Kristof recently wrote an article in the New York Times on the challenges faced and the pain caused by the current coronavirus pandemic in New York City. Mr. Kristoff was given a rare opportunity to visit two hospitals in the Bronx that are on the front lines of the war against the coronavirus. The article touched on a number of issues, but one of the ones that he highlighted was a great fear among healthcare workers as they work diligently to provide care for those who, who they ask they, who are sickened by the, the, the disease. The fear of being sickened themselves, the fear of infecting their loved ones, but above all, the fear for those who they treat so lovingly and carefully. Mr. Christoph makes it clear that fear is a very human reaction and emotion. And it is very natural in the very difficult environment in which, pe in which people are currently operating. He writes, courage is not fearlessness. Courage is what soldiers exhibit when they charge into battle despite their fears. And it's what, it's what apprehensive physicians or worried nurses display when they walk into that zone, that hot zone, each day. The same is true of physician assistants, technicians, respiratory therapists, and cleaners. Those frontline workers take great risks. Our gospel lesson this morning brings us face to face with the issues of fear and doubt in the early Christian community. It is the evening of the first Easter. Earlier in the morning, Mary Magdalene had gone to the grave and recognized that Jesus' body was no longer there. It is now evening. And as evening approaches, fear grips the disciples more and more. The cruel act of the crucifixion of Jesus had its desired effect. The Romans carried out crucifixion with a certain aim. They wanted to punish evildoers, all criminals as they considered them. But they also wanted to make a statement. They wanted it to be clear that no one should go against them. And they wanted to be an instrument of control and power. The disciples saw what had happened to Jesus, the innocent Jesus, and they feared for their own lives. Now fear can trigger other emotions. And on that, on that day, on that first Easter evening, fear was accompanied by doubt. Fearful people can sometimes become doubtful people. Many of you this morning, even as you go about on this the second Sunday of Easter, you are fearful. You are fearful about what you have heard, the stories you have heard. You are fearful about some of what you have seen, whether with your eyes or on TV. You have probably been wondering too, where is God in all of this? Where is the God that we have always called upon? Where is the God who promises to be our God? as we grapple with our fears and doubts today, I would like to 
to invite us to think a little bit about how the early church dealt with its fear and its doubts. The early Christians were, were living in a, a, a time around that first Easter where things were very different from they are now. But the issues that caused fear were pretty similar. What did they do? How did they survive? And there are different ways in which we can handle the fear and the doubt that we face. But what did they do? First of all, the disciples retreated to a safe, familiar place. So what they did was they locked themselves away in the room that they were used to meeting in a place that was familiar to them. They took all the precautions to protect themselves. They, did, they were not going to leave it up, leave any, take anything for granted, or leave anything up to chance. And they locked the door behind them. And as they locked the door behind them, they fellowship with each other. The fellowship that they had brought about encouragement as they encourage each other in the situations in which they found themselves. And the encouragement lifted their spirits, strengthened their hearts, and renewed their hope. They now, no doubt, read from the parts of the Old Testament that were available to them. By this time, they would have had the first five books of the Bible, the books of prophecy, the books of the writings like the Psalm and the Proverbs, and they no doubt engage in reading those, those various books of the Bible, parts of them anyway, and encouraging each other. As you face your own fears, and as you stay at home, take the opportunity to connect with others, as many of you have been doing. You may not be able to do so physically, but this is indeed the time to reach out to others in, in, other, in many other ways calling, writing, and using the various technological means available to you. But even as they were engaged in reading the scriptures, as they were engaged in fellowshipping, the other thing that they would do is that they engage in prayer. Prayer was so much a part of what Jesus did. And prayer was so much a part of the life of the early church. They probably prayed that psalm that David wrote that most of you know so well, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And they probably emphasize this part of the, of the Psalm where it says, Yea. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Well, they also knew about God's provisions, and they probably said, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. But I bet you they did not stop there. They probably remember one of the Psalms of David where David says to God, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. I want us to remember the power of prayer. The early church continued, never forgot the power of prayer. And I want you to, to take into consideration that, power, that prayer is a powerful weapon that we have not fully utilized. We have, we're still, in many ways, disregarding its efficacy, disregarding its potency. Those early Christians as they dealt with the fear of the Roman authorities, they engaged in prayer. But God has a way of responding to our cries and to our prayers. 
You see, when God sees our suffering, God has a way of responding when God sees our pain. God has a way of responding when God hears the cries of our heart. And the scripture tells us that in the middle of the fear that these disciples were exhibiting, Jesus walk, comes in through locked doors. Jesus did not knock on the door for them to open. They probably would have been too scared to open anyway. But Jesus comes in through the locked doors and stands with them. We knew all along that Jesus was human and with, and with all human characteristics. No, we are reminded by this passage that Jesus is also a spirit. And one of the dangers that we face as we deal with this virus is that we can't see it. We don't, we, we, it's, not, it's, not, it's not visible to the naked eye. And sometimes that's why we have so much fear. Because we don't know where it is. We don't know whether it's on the ground. We don't know where it is. It's on a, on a doorknob. But I want us to understand too that Jesus is everywhere. We can't see Jesus. But Jesus is a spirit. And if we ever doubted that Jesus was a spirit, we read this passage that Jesus walked through. He came through locked doors and stood right there. We also see that God does not always use the means that we think about. God, use, God has at God's disposal any means possible to respond to God's people. Jesus is able, as Paul says, to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can, we can ask or imagine. God has a way of surprising us. And this passage reminds us of that. Now, you would think that after such a display of power, after such a display of care, after such a display of concern, everyone would be convinced that Jesus Christ was indeed risen. But no, Thomas is not there. And so when Thomas comes, they tell him what has happened. And Thomas says, well, you know, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. You know, there's a little bit of Thomas in all of us. We like to call Thomas the doubting Thomas. And just like how Thomas is probably the second most reviled disciple. The most reviled disciple, of course, is Judas. We see all sorts of things about Judas. And then Thomas probably comes next. We call him Doubting Thomas. And we see all sorts of things about him. But if truth be told, many of us have a little bit of Thomas in us. And throughout the scriptures, we see people who have a little bit of Thomas in them. They, God has been good to them. God has been great to them and God has been merciful. But yet they forget who God is and turn their backs on God. Or forget and decide that they're not going to obey what God has said and told them to do. We are often quick to call Thomas the doubting Thomas. But there's a little bit of Thomas in all of us. Now, the good news the good news about this is that Jesus is a caring Jesus. That Jesus understands all of what we go through because remember, Jesus apart from being spirit was human and walked on this earth. So Jesus understood what Thomas was going through. We're told that Jesus heard about what Thomas had said. Jesus did not judge him. But Jesus did one of, one of those mirac miraculous things once more. Jesus wasn't finished with his miracles. They were again in the room sometime later. And Jesus does the same thing. Jesus walks through the locked doors. And comes in. And tells them that there will be peace with them. And invites Thomas to come and, and to feel 
the, 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 the wounds and to feel the mark of the nails in his hands and on, in his side. Jesus is, not, is simply not going to dismiss us. Jesus is not going to reject us because of what we do or say. But there's something about Thomas. There's one way in which Thomas has started the process to overcome his doubt. Thomas expressed it. Thomas talked about his doubt. He expressed it openly. And so the disciples knew that he was doubtful. And God heard that he was doubtful. And one of the things I want to remind us is that we're going to have our doubts. And we need to have an opportunity to express those. There are many people today who were once part of a Christian community and are no longer part of it. Because they had doubts about certain things and they expressed the doubts and they were ostracized and put out. Very often, if people, are, some people express their doubts in some areas and some communities, others reject them and wonder if something is wrong with them. But sometimes doubt comes about because of things that we have seen and experienced. Thomas had never heard of anybody being raised from the dead. Thomas had never heard of somebody putting a tomb, get up and walk around. Thomas had never heard of somebody who was crucified on the cross. Then, late two days or three days later rather, get up and walk around. And so for him, it was hard for him to understand what the others were saying. And that is why he wanted proof. Somebody around you might be doubting. He might, you, you might wonder why it is they are doubting. Can't they, uh, can't they see? But I want you to understand that this spiritual journey is not the same for every one of us. Some of us have struggles that others of us don't have. Some of us have gone through experiences that others of us have not. And our doubts may linger a little bit longer because of what we have seen or, or sometimes because of what we have not seen. So when others express their doubts, don't dismiss them. That may be an opportunity for more prayer. Jesus did not dismiss Thomas's doubt. Once more, Jesus reaffirms the gift of God's peace. Because as he comes in, he gives them peace and reminds them that God's peace is with them. And affirms Thomas in the middle of his doubt. Jesus, as he says, peace to them. We remember what Jesus had said to his disciples on the night before he was crucified. Jesus had called them together and had a time with them, sharing with them. And Jesus said to them, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. This lesson in the lecture, lectionary on this, this, this Sunday after Easter couldn't have come at a more appropriate time for many of us as we face our doubts, as we face our fears. And as we, we live around others who are facing doubts and fears. But I want you to know that this passage provides an opportunity for us to think about how we can start overcoming the fears and the doubts which are a natural part of human existence. As long as you live on this earth, you will have fears and doubts. They can develop as we, are, as we are confronted with the issues of life. Why do you not create many of them? We have the ability to confront them and overcome them. We have a huge responsibility. But I want to remind you that we are not alone. Jesus did not leave his disciples alone. The Jesus who rose from the dead still walks around and unfettered by the cords that tied him to the cross, unhindered by the injuries to his body and his, his feet and his side. 
and ready to unleash torrents and showers of peace on all of us. I pray that this day, even as you confront your fears and your doubts, that you remember that the spiritual Jesus still walks around. You may not be able to see him, but I pray that you'll be able to feel him and experience him. May God be your strength today. In the name of Christ, we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm.